Daddy, what's that? Ah, oh, well, my boy, that's a JPEG that your great-grandfather purchased over 75 years ago. Cost him $3,000, and one day you'll inherit it too, just like I did from my father. Can I play with it? What? No, of course not. The game hasn't been released yet. It's, it's a pledge. You're backing the development. You're not buying anything. So it's not real. Star Citizen is a video game unlike any other. To some, it's the greatest feat of digital engineering ever envisioned, with a brilliant leader and vibrant community supporting its development. To others, it's a toxic and brainwashed cult who zealously silence any criticism of their utopian vision of a galactic paradise. Crowdfunded projects have developed a reputation for ending in humiliation, scandal, and financial destitution. Sometimes the project was a rug pull scam from the very conception, or more often, the right intentions were were there, but the idea was never remotely feasible, like developing an entire video game with no coding experience. Backers are more often than not left disappointed and with little recourse to get their money back. Depending on who you ask, Star Citizen is either the story of the most successful crowdfunded project of all time, with the total amount pledged reaching 500 million just a few weeks ago. Also, not coincidentally, the largest video game budget in history or it's a story of abuse, exploitation, and sheer ineptitude. Despite being in development for over a decade, the game is still nowhere near completion, and anyone who has played it will undoubtedly testify that what little of it does exist somehow manages to be the most breathtaking and touchingly beautiful experience possible on a gaming PC, and the most soul-crushing and nightmare-inducing horror at the exact same time. This is the story of the fractured and complex world of Star Citizen. Every universe needs a god, and there's only one man brave enough to take on the challenge of building a new one. Chris Roberts became known for his groundbreaking work on the Wing Commander franchise back in the 1990s. He's a pioneer of the space sim genre, and his early games would receive widespread acclaim, blending both Roberts' love for filmmaking and his unadulterated passion for spaceflight into some of the most influential games of the decade. In 1991, the original Wing Commander was ranked by Computer Gaming World as the seventh best PC video game of all time. By combining cutting-edge gameplay with live cinematic action sequences, Roberts gave players a chance to live out a dream of being an ace fighter pilot like Han Solo or Pete Mitchell. But to Roberts, these weren't just games. He was also living out his own dream of making the best space simulator possible, whatever that took. I've never been accused of having a small vision. He originally started doing so under the guidance of Studio Origin Systems, eventually becoming disillusioned with their creative rigidity, choosing to split and form his own company, Digital Anvil. There was never love lost between Roberts and his publishers. Though to many, the idea of having their game successfully funded and published is a dream come true, to Roberts it always came with the sale of of his soul. Publishers have expectations and demand a return on investment. Their creative sensibilities are driven less by artistic vision and more by market valuation. Where Roberts would always sacrifice money and time in pursuit of his dream, his publishers forcefully reined in that ambition in favour of actually putting out a product. This would finally come to a head during production of Digital Anvil's second game, Freelancer. Looking up at the stars, Roberts dreamed of a genuine virtual galaxy that operated independently of the player's presence or actions. A dynamic economy, AI-controlled spaceships and traders, real-time facial hair growth, and space venereal disease. He wanted a universe that actually felt alive. However, effectively bankrupt, Roberts was forced into a studio buyout with Microsoft, who would mercilessly cut through both freelancers' scope and Roberts' own involvement. Eventually publishing a game that, although praised for allowing players to live out the fantasy of the total annihilation of France, lacked that dynamic world and much of the features that would have made the game truly different. It wasn't the dream. Roberts realised that however genuinely he believed he could build his dream, a publisher was always more interested in profit, and that was utterly incompatible with the enormity of the scale of what he was trying to do. He needed a different strategy altogether, and he would find it through crowdfunding. With his wife and a friend, Roberts founded the now infamous Cloud Imperium Games, and in September 2012, they announced their new game, Star Citizen. It would be a spiritual successor to Wing Commander. The game was set to be announced via a private crowdfunding page, with a goal of raising $500,000 to produce the game Roberts had always dreamed of. He was nervous. Every crowdfunded project lives and dies on the strength of its day one pitch. You're not selling a game, you're selling a promise of something greater. 
and Roberts blows it away. Delivering his pitch from an actual spaceship, the audience crashed the website within minutes. The interest was so great, he had to enlist Kickstarter to help ease the burden, and within 30 days, there was over $2 million from 30,000 backers in the CIG piggy bank to produce a campaign and multiplayer space simulator experience with an estimated release date of November 2014. Star Citizen was a universe of freedom and possibility, a galaxy to escape to and explore, and this was a particularly powerful dream. But it wouldn't stop there. Roberts couldn't help himself. He extended the funding ceiling with stretch goals all the way up to 65 million, complete with juicy stretch rewards. And before long, the game would hit all of those. I think we can all agree the project is a little late, and during this time, CIG have raised $500 million. To put that into perspective, that's over $400 million. It's also nearly the combined budget of the next two most expensive games ever developed put together, and both of those games actually came out. But the game is still nowhere near completion, so what on earth went wrong? To answer that, you need to understand what is available currently in the game. Star Citizen is broken into four main parts. First is Squadron 42, the campaign. Wing Commander was almost named Squadron, so this component is its most direct spiritual successor. It apparently stars highly paid actors such as Mark Hamill, Gary Oldman and Gillian Anderson. It now has to be purchased as a separate game from CIG, but it's not a game you can't play. No one knows anything about it or has even seen it. It's been MIA for many years. The other three modules you can play. First is Hangar, which was the first content to be released in August 2013. Anyone who's ever stood in a garage and watched their unmoving car will know what it's like to experience Hangar. Now, being fair on it, like a garage, you can put some decorations around your space car, like a space fish tank. Next is Arena Commander, a significant milestone released in 2014 because it allowed what I'd consider the first actual gameplay. In Arena Commander, you can dogfight and race against AI or other players in your spaceship, even a battle royale mode. It's probably the most game-like experience you will currently get from Star Citizen. Then you have Space Marine, a first-person shooter module noted for its troubled development and absolutely horrendously buggy gameplay, even in Star Citizen terms. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about fun, it's somewhere probably around the same level as being waterboarded, perhaps enjoyed in limited doses by a small dedicated minority, but most would agree a largely unpleasant experience to be avoided. And finally, the Persistent Universe, currently an open expansive solar system with several planets, moons and space rocks to explore where up to 50 players can exist together in a server, mining, trading, delivering cargo, fighting and completing missions either alone or together. This is the module most people recognise when talking about Star Citizen and it's definitely the focus of controversy. Playing in the PU as it's known in the community is certainly a memorable experience. White Light probably describes it most accurately. Things get fraught about one second in when the game's staggeringly awful performance races with its staggeringly beautiful presentation to make the first impression. Every frame a painting and you'll get to savour every frame. At its best, Star Citizen is truly glorious. You wake up on a planet in your own little room, take an elevator and then a train to the airport. You call your ship, wait for it to be physically delivered and take another elevator to the hangar. And all this leads to one of the moments of Star Citizen. Stepping into the hangar to be greeted by a ship you've never flown before and then feeling the sheer size is truly awe-inspiring. There's something other space sim games like Elite Dangerous and No Man's Sky can't replicate here that I think is very important for understanding the appeal of Star Citizen. The ships are just phenomenally built. The design language has a fidelity unrivaled in any genre of any other video game. Luxurious vessels just ooze sex appeal with smooth lines and subtle curves. The exposed pipework and rigid compartments of military gunships and the utilitarian vast cargo halls of freighters feel genuine, often inspired by existing aircraft, making everything feel like it has a real purpose. The most important distinction is that in Star Citizen, you just walk to that ship. You find the control room, physically sit down and turn on the systems manually. You ascend into the upper atmosphere completely of your own will. See the rain bounce off the glass of your cockpit and feel the air turbulence as your engines force your ship away from the ground. Seamlessly, you feel the atmosphere thin and gravity slips away as you're just slowly enveloped by the vast and empty blackness of space. There are no loading screens or transitions, nothing 
nothing to interrupt the absolute freedom to go anywhere and see anything. At any point, feel free to get out the seat to walk around that ship, eat a snack, or even open the airlocks to transition perfectly between your ship's artificial gravity and just floating through space itself. I've never felt a sense of genuine hostility landing on an unknown planet in a space sim before, but dropping down onto a frozen tundra in the dead of night and stepping out of your safe and warm ship into an expansive wasteland is tirelessly atmospheric. Alone or with friends, you can hunt down pirates, buy and sell cargo at the most dynamic of prices, mine minerals by hand, rover or ship, fly to distant moons to protect bunkers, repair installations, buy newer larger ships or just explore the vastness of this universe. Once to know what happens when you launch a battle tank out of a spaceship at suborbital stratospheric heights? Well, no one's telling you you can't find out the answer. At its best, Star Citizen is an extraordinary masterpiece, but behind the smoke and mirrors, there is also a very dark side, and we have to now see Star Citizen at its equal worst. So what does that look like? A big part of the problem is that in pursuit of living in such a high fidelity metaverse, Chris Roberts will always sacrifice gameplay for realism. If you don't set your spawn point at a space station, it'll take 15 minutes to make that same long walk from bedroom to your ship. It's fun once or twice, but after the fifth time, you start to realise it's all poorly disguised filler content. You can't do anything in the room, and the entire journey is just W keying forward. If you explore around too much, you'll kind of realise that it's a lot of dead end doors and places that you can't actually do anything inside of. Launching certain ships out of the ridiculously large gas giant Crusader can take up to 20 minutes of real-time flight. And much like the train, there is nothing to do while you're in flight, so you're just sitting at your desk waiting. Travelling long distances is also pretty tedious. If you have to cross the galaxy, journeys from one planet to another can take painfully long at times. With friends, this is more bearable, but alone I personally find myself unable to play the game without watching something on a second monitor, or going off from my PC at strategic times to make food. There are no shortcuts in Star Citizen and part of the price of freedom to go anywhere is you will have to go anywhere you want. Whereas No Man's Sky allows the use of teleportation and gate jumping across systems to cut out some of that mindless travel time, Star Citizen elects to keep it all in. It's like if a movie was extended by five hours to include all the time the characters have to travel from location to location. Yes, you can get up to get snacks or go watch a YouTube video while you wait, but when you're there to see the movie, and you've paid for it, it's not the best user experience. That logic also applies to claiming ships from terminals. If your ship is destroyed or in another location, you have to wait for it to be re-delivered. In theory, it makes sense from a realism perspective that you shouldn't be flying the biggest ship possible with a one or two man crew for the sake of it, but if you have a medium to large ship and you have to reclaim it because of a glitch, waiting an hour to stare at a screen for 20 minutes of flight, then mining rocks for an hour while watching YouTube, for the servers to then crash entirely, which they routinely do, losing you all your money, that doesn't really feel like gameplay, it's just wasted time. And because there's so little actual content in the game currently, a lot of your gameplay time is just spent doing things that aren't really actual gameplay. Speaking of making money, though you can buy almost anything within game currency, making that money is very tedious. Rather than the gameplay itself being fun with a financial ward as a nice bonus, the missions currently in-game are dull and repetitive labour, with money the only real positive. Space courier missions require you to fly to four separate locations to physically move around boxes. It's nice at first to go see the different outposts, but it's the kind of experience most people would probably like to do two or three times and then move on to something more meaningful. It's especially frustrating when the Amazon locker refuses to take your box, preventing you from finishing the mission and making that money. And your first trip to recover a black box from a destroyed ship is atmospheric, creepy and tense. You really feel a sense of isolation that danger may be hiding around the corner. The trailers also develop this by hinting there may be hidden fauna, however none of that actually exists in the game, so you again realise it's just another box moving job. Exploration is pretty much walking around aimlessly. There's nothing to explore and no rewards for searching places. And once you've seen four or five locations, you kind of know the template for everything you would see in the game. The ground combat bunker missions are also horrifically buggy. The AI lacks even basic intelligence, so these become a hunt around identical underground locations while you try and find 10 enemies before getting killed yourself. They're often completely oblivious to the player, just hiding in a random location, and often spawning right behind you, granting 
causing a near instant death. I know this is primarily a space flight simulator, but the ground stuff always feels uncomfortable to me, kind of lacking the polish you would expect in a modern first person shooter. The problem with doing a lot in Star Citizen is compounded with the fact that many of the controls and gameplay features are completely unexplained, so it's difficult to get straight into playing without spending some significant time investigating how to even stay alive. I'm not looking for the game to hold my hand through everything like a baby, but there is a big difference between belittling the player and making user interfaces overly complex and unintuitive, like the inventory system, items being unnecessarily difficult to pick up and store, looking for buttons to open doors does get a bit tiring, and looting corpses is a ridiculously slow and arduous task. For a game that places a huge importance on realism and immersion in making these systems less accessible, seeing hordes of dead-eyed NPCs T-posing and standing on chairs just kills all believability. I know it's an early access game and that's a big point that any criticism is usually met with, but at the same time it really feels like we shouldn't even be playing on the little that does exist, and especially shouldn't be charged so much for it. Another problem is the way you play the game is equally response to the mechanics and a necessary function of survival in order to avoid the myriad of bugs. There are more unnecessary elevators in Star Citizen than any game I've ever played, which makes them all the more terrifying as these boxes of vertical misery are a sentient and dangerous enemy. You'll always be double checking to make sure an elevator has actually arrived to avoid stepping out into the back rooms. Sometimes even standing too close to one in a space station will result in you being sucked out into the vacuum of space. I always dread interacting with elevators and I don't really think that's a way a game should make you feel. A huge part of playing the game is modifying your behaviour to avoid an untimely death and without a strong reliance on YouTube and Reddit guides, a new player would be completely lost in the mess that this game is to play. And the fact that you'll experience much of it at a frame rate similar to that of a PowerPoint presentation certainly doesn't make it any better. Even if you completely disagree with my opinions on how enjoyable the intended gameplay loops in Star Citizen are to play currently, you have to admit it is still a tortured love dealing with how unstable the game can be. And I know many people wish they could get their friends online to play with them, but can either not recommend the game in good faith or struggle to get their friends to stick past the steep learning curve. At best, Star Citizen is a manageably buggy and rough experience, but at its worst, it is just completely unplayable. So the question this undoubtedly leads us to is how is it that with $500 million and 10 years of development, is the game still in such an unfinished state? And perhaps more importantly, how did the game even raise that much money without any real gameplay? The actual facts of Star Citizen are known only to a select few who actually work on the project so most actual information is just a loosely informed opinion. Spectrum is an ironically apt name of the Star Citizen community forums as the game's community itself broadly ranges on a spectrum of complete unfiltered delusion to equally irate rage. If there's one thing this game does well, it's controversy. Some of the game's most ardent supporters refuse to believe anything has ever gone wrong and nothing CIG and Roberts have ever done can be or should be criticised. I think if anyone still here has that opinion, this video is probably not going to change your mind in any way and I just hope that, like the rest of us, you get the game you've paid for or at least find some peace. I think an important question is how many of those original backers would have still pledged back in 2014 if they knew they wouldn't be playing the game at over a decade later. The right expectations for going into Star Citizen are pretty crucial and I wanted to point out how it differs from a traditional development. Usually rounds of funding are supplied from publishers to developers as the project hits certain milestones. It's a well tested traditional method for maintaining accountability. Developers need continuous funding or the expensive production cycle will grind to a halt and the studio will collapse. Publishers only make money on games that have been released and can be sold. By having to hit specific milestones during the cycle, it in theory keeps the developer focused on actually getting the project out and prevents the budget having to infinitely increase because of scope and feature changes. And audiences buy that game and generate the profit for both the hard work of the developers and the risk the publishers took in financing. Though there is no one standard format, developers often make money from the publisher at key stages such as when the game is first playable, in alpha, code freeze where nothing new is added to the game, bugs are just fixed from existing code, and then on to beta and release, etc. 
As a rough comparison, Star Citizen is branded as being an alpha development. There is considerable and heated debate from the community about what the word alpha should mean and what players should expect from the game. It's generally accepted a game has entered its alpha version when key gameplay functionality has been implemented and the game is feature complete, meaning it contains all the major features and is playable. The development team's focus at this point is to finish the existing code base rather than implementing new add-ons, which doesn't sound very accurate for Star Citizen. In fact, we have what I think is more aptly described as a pre-alpha, barely playable tech demo. So it makes sense that the gameplay is pretty horrific and the bugs make what little there is completely unplayable. However, this is what makes Star Citizen different from any other game. Because the funding has already been fully delivered, nothing undertaken by the developers is actually making money. It's only an expense. Finishing the game no longer means anything because no deadlines are tied financially to the success of the company, so Roberts is equally free to pursue any feature at will. Suddenly, delaying the project by a year doesn't really cause a problem. You don't need to put it out, so why not wait? The funding is still coming in, so the expectation of Star Citizen ever being a finished game is only based on the faith that Chris Roberts can deliver it of his own willpower and considering we're 10 years in with this I don't really have much faith. In the first two years of development, the production team swelled to several hundred devs in multiple studio locations around the world. This was perhaps the first warning sign of how bloated and unwieldy the project was set to become. Fast forward to the present day and the Manchester studio working on Squadron 42 is set to tip the company over into employing over 1,000 full-time and contracted staff. This is not a good sign. Brooks Law is a good example of why. Adding more people to a delayed project just delays it further as it takes time to make Make these new people useful and each member has to understand the work that came before them, diminishing productivity for some time. Similarly, the amount of possible communication channels increases rapidly. People have to spend more time figuring out what others are doing, so the managerial burden rapidly increases and not all tasks can be divided between developers. With one woman you can make one baby in nine months, but nine women can't make a baby in one month. There's just more work in the same time. And even when those tasks can be divided, the smell of extra developers attract more bugs, increasing the amount of debugging time before any feature can be committed and this has already happened in Star Citizen. Ilphonic Studios were hired to work on the Star Marine module in 2014. Despite their not overly impressive track record of making games, one of the particularities of Star Citizen is that it was developed using CryEngine. This engine underpinned the Crisis game series and has been renowned for its graphic fidelity. At the time the results it produced were really influential in gaming, but the engine was built for large open environments in single player FPS style games. It's an interesting choice that Chris would choose CryEngine for a massively online multiplayer as its use would cause problems right from the beginning. It was a challenge for CIG to find developers with enough experience creating games using the engine as it was never that widely used. That meant the main criteria for employment was working with CryEngine, enter Ilphonic. Even then, the engine had to be significantly modified to run Star Citizen to the point where it barely resembled the original engine. A lot of people have wondered why Roberts would choose an engine that was firstly hard limited to only 50 players a server, and it was never really intended to be used outside of FPS shooters, requiring very specific and time consuming alterations. But I personally speculate it speaks to his uncompromising stance to getting the best graphics possible without really being too worried about how realistic it is to achieve that. This is where it's important to note something very particular about Roberts. He is, by many accounts, a dictatorial ruler over his developers. I literally heard him say, make that pixel blue, not green. There is one way Roberts wants his game to be made, and that is exactly the way it's going to happen. Throughout 2014, audiences were routinely lied to by Roberts that Star Marine was right around the corner. In reality, due to a lack of proper communication and documentation, Ilphonic had designed a version of Star Marine that was incompatible with CIG's Frankenstein engine. Roberts decided to fire Ilphonic and bring that work in-house, delaying the module's release and wasting considerable time and money. But when you have a man like Roberts, who likes to personally approve minor details down to the uniform NPCs wear, suddenly managing hundreds of developers, Developers, the important strategic oversight is lost in favour of perfecting inconsequentially small details instead of focusing on what matters to complete the game. What you get is a few highly polished individual aesthetic features built around a framework that can barely even sustain basic gameplay. This is a good time to talk more about creep. Scope and feature creep are problems that have always plagued any project undertaken by humans. Either new features get added during a development, like dynamically increasing bedsheets, or the scope of those 
particular features becomes unnecessarily complex. We don't really need to use four elevators and have a train ride making it take 15 minutes just to get into our ships. We could just spawn pretty near them. It's not adding to the fun, that's for sure, but it's the most complex iteration of each feature that gets implemented by Roberts. And this has always been a core problem with Star Citizen. When Roberts initially sold this dream, I don't even think he himself realized how difficult it would be to implement a tiny fraction of the promises made, and it all began with his space pegs. When you're crowdfunding a game, you have to offer rewards in return for someone investing in the project. Ideally, you want to maximize the difference between the effort and cost. If you can get $50 from someone for promising an entire game, that takes quite a lot of effort to meet the burden. But if you offer an extra intangible reward, like a signed photo from the devs, and then mark it up for $1,000, for that hour of work, you've just made 20 times more. What Roberts has done with his ships is build an intangible empire he now can't contain. Although they hold no value in the real world, these space JPEGs will sell anywhere from $35 to $3,000 each. And that's before we even mentioned the packs. What Roberts invented was the macro transaction. And this is the source of one of the biggest rifts in the community. To most, the idea of spending even hundreds of dollars on a virtual spaceship is inexplicable. And in this context, it most definitely is. But Roberts isn't selling a ship. He's using those ships as a ticket to a universe of possibility. Is 2000 really too much to pay to live out your childhood dream? A trip to Disney World could well cost the same and that only lasts 18 hours. But if you plan to play Star Citizen for even a thousand hours, is it really that much? CIG themselves have compared it to golf or sailing and I'll let you be a judge of how apt a comparison that is. But in any case, these ships have always been the Achilles heel for Chris Roberts. Though they've granted him financial freedom to take the project in whatever direction he wishes. By selling variants of ships like medical, cargo, hauling, mining, salvage and troop transport, Roberts implied gameplay loops that didn't exist in the original scope. Once you sell a ship that requires a minimum crew of 23 players into a game that can only fit 50 players on a single server, suddenly huge technical hurdles are introduced and the scope of the game now has to dramatically increase to justify anyone paying for an experience that as of yet only exists in the loose imagination of Chris Roberts. To make that capital ship worthwhile, we now need NPC AI control, docking with space stations, physicalized cargo, a medical and respawn technology, recovery and salvage system, the ability to serve and make food. It's not that a drinks mixing minigame on a space Boeing 777 brought down Star Citizen in itself. It's that those 2000 small features needed to sell the dream mean that instead of a core set of polished features, nothing works the way it should. The players paying up to $27,000 for a single package are investing in a virtualized future for themselves that Roberts has never actually had the capability to deliver. These macro transactions are now a cornerstone of the game, siphoning money out of space whales, and many ships require you to have already spent thousands to be offered the chance to even purchase. Concierge status and its many superficial rewards are a great way to show how deeply you buy into the game, a status symbol in the community, and in a game where the only real gameplay is spending more money, there are people willing to spend thousands, and that's only at the low end of the space whales. Not surprisingly, a lot of people end up regretting investing their time and money in Robert's dream, so a sizable community of refundians has opened up, people who have exited the project. It's notoriously quite difficult to get a refund. Initially, if the project wasn't delivered in two years, you had a right to get a refund, but Roberts quietly changed that so that only if he gives up on the project will you be able to get any money back. And the legal troubles that it's created are an interesting rabbit hole of ex-whales seeking to claim back money that has disappeared into the deep black hole of Star Citizen. As part of its feverish commitment to capitalistic realism, CIG will eventually require all ships to be insured. If you lose your ship and it's not covered, you'll lose real money. Buying new ships will eventually take up to weeks to be delivered. So effectively, you have to pay for a game, pay for a ship in that game, and then continuously pay to keep that ship insured so that you don't lose it. But up to a certain point, ships were sold with lifetime insurance. So this has created a limited number of highly sought after space pegs with prices getting exorbitantly high and a thriving middle dealer community connecting buyers and sellers, which some entrepreneurial people have exploited to pay for real world things. There's a lot of space FOMO driving a market based on nothing but the belief that gameplay may one day justify the cost. Why is there a tank in a space game? I honestly can't tell you. Chris Roberts can't tell you. 
but buying these specialized ships and ground vehicles is like signing up for a space job. It's a promise that you'll be special and in that way it's completely intrinsic to Star Citizen. The macro transactions and the game can never be separated. Chris Roberts can't reduce the scope because then he'd have to admit that the dream he sold was a complete lie. For a while CIG was selling non-existent plots of land for up to $100 and even today many of the ships sold are still yet to materialize. That's why I'm scared playing Star Citizen because all the gameplay loops and activities you can do are merely there to waste time and distract you from how astronomically far away this project is from achieving a playable version of what's even in the game currently. And when I see the unending list of things Roberts wants to add, I think most people even as non-developers can see the technical challenge of implementing these is just phenomenal. Out of the 100 systems promised back in 2014, not even one has been finished a decade later. As nice as the ships actually in the game are, most of the rooms inside are functionless. Inside the $600 Carrack, there's a cartography table where you can pretend to chart a path through space, bathrooms with functioning toilets that never need to be used, or a pool table to stand next to with friends and pretend to play space pool. It's a game that's much more fun to think about than actually playing it, which is why I do empathise with the people who spend thousands of dollars investing in this game because if Roberts could actually achieve it it would be pretty incredible. But this is a really big part of the problem when discussing the success or failures of Star Citizen. If you look at any criticism about the state of the game, it's always met with a response of this will be fixed or will work when X is sorted out. Huge portions of the game can only work when other theoretical pieces are in place, server meshing being one of these. This piece of technology holds back much of the proposed content Star Citizen could one day offer, but the feasibility of actually implementing it is somewhat questionable. I'm not going to go deeper into server meshing because I think I already made my point about how to Robert, the idea of compromising his vision and scaling back the game is always going to be second to even the slimmest of possibilities of achieving the most technologically demanding option. But even if we were to trust CIG's most recent timeline, it won't even make it into the alpha until midway through 2023. Personally, I'd rather just have a fun to play space sim game. I don't need to migrate my entire personal identity into the Star Citizen metaverse, but I get some people want that, even if it means waiting until the game's stops being science fiction and actually becomes a historical adaptation. It's very difficult to trust Chris Roberts' expectations of delivering anything after a decade of development. After so long, the level of polish that's going to be needed to justify the time is huge. Arguably, Squadron 42 not existing is probably the best thing it could do to promote the game. Because it doesn't actually exist, backers are free to envision however grand a dream they want. Even if the campaign is just okay, it could seriously damage the project's reputation. And every year of additional development that passes means the expectations for what both Squadron 42 and Star Citizen have to deliver get increasingly high. The sunk cost fallacy is reflected in the way some of the most diehard supporters viciously attack anyone who criticizes the game. It's not unheard of for people to receive death threats even when suggesting that maybe $27,000 is an excessive price to charge for an in-game package of which most of the content isn't even real. The mere suggestion that this dream might end up as vaporware gets people very agitated and this is reflected all the way back to Roberts himself. CIG released the roadmap to trap development progress but ironically had to delay it while they worked on developing the tools needed to make the roadmap. Then it was somewhat controversially removed because Chris Roberts thought it was distracting that the community tried to use that roadmap to hold the dev team accountable for the missing deadlines. What little of the roadmap does exist right now is obscured by the volume of meaningless deliverables. What I want to know is whether this game is going to come out in my lifetime or whether I should make sure to include my login details in my will so that at least my great grandson might be able to play. It's at a point where there's a genuine possibility that a good proportion of the original backer community will no longer be alive to even see the finished version of the game. And this is why people call Star Citizen a cult when people receive death threats for suggesting that dynamically creasing bedsheets might just be an example of feature creep. The development has taken so long that multiple areas of finished work are having to be completely redone to modernize them. Even adding in community events required an entire planet to be removed from the solar system. So to me, the only visible progress seems to be going backwards, with the exception of a steady stream of new ship variants to buy, which the pledge store never seems to run out of those. I personally agree with Forbes that Star Citizen isn't quite fraud, but incompetence and mismanagement on a galactic scale. Part of what always made me uncomfortable was that there is always a sense in the community that we're right around the corner from some major update that will revolutionize the way the game is played. I think new players are sucked into the belief that everything is happening right now, so it's a perfect time to get involved and invest. But in reality, 
guarantee this has been the case for years and years. It's so weird for, to see people defend the insane prices Roberts is charging, even though I find the idea of Star Citizen pretty cool and I would like to see it successful. I'm not even sure the ends justify the extremely exploitative prices. I know a lot of people argue that it's not a purchase but a pledge to support the development, but $80 for a hoodie and $30 for a cup seems really icky to me. I equally find it really weird that people defend the lack of accountability CIG has to the community. It's no coincidence that as the game passed its half a billion funding milestone, the company has said absolutely nothing. What currently exists in the game is a complete embarrassment. I always find it so weird that people celebrate the most minor bug fixes as some kind of technological revolution and proof that CIG is making this dream a reality. I know for a fact that that, just as other video essays made throughout the years have informed my research with points that are eerily accurate today as they were when they were made back in 2016, that this video will only be a single link in the long and continued chain in a growing backlash against Star Citizen. CIG has posted over a thousand YouTube videos but has yet to even release one game. For me, I personally only ever invested the minimum $45 and got that refunded a few weeks later when I realised what the game was really like. I remember when I saw those first trailers and I specifically remember the big sandworm and thinking that this might just be the coolest space game ever. But from my experience playing Star Citizen, I might have found a lot of sand, but I've never found a lot of worm. 